The roadshow is in one of Britain's most beautiful landscapes. The gentle grandeur of its hills and the tranquility of its waters have been celebrated by writers from Beatrix Potter to William Wordsworth. We're on Lake Windermere in the Lake District, our largest national park. But what you might not know about Lake Windermere is its less tranquil side. For some people, a peaceful cruise like this just doesn't cut it. Since the 1920s, daredevil adventurers have used these lakes to break dozens of world water speed records. That legacy is celebrated in a striking new museum. It's home to historic vessels that have plied their trade on the lake and some more unusual items with a dramatic story to tell. Like this modest wicker chair. More about that later. But for now, welcome to the Antiques Roadshow at Windermere Jetty Museum. Coming up... Gene Autry's hut. <laughs> it looks good. This is one of the earliest specimens I've ever seen. That's why I'm so excited about it. We're very excited as well. <laughs> really? Goodness. This is a really important piece of jewellery. Oh. <laughs> Ooh, five pounds for a 17th century wine <laughs> bottle. You said, I'm just going to throw them in the skip. And I was like, what? You know, you can't, can't do that. I'll, I'll take them off your hands. Like. Whenever I see two pieces of art glass side by side like this, I'm thinking, I've got an art glass collector in front of me. Uh, would I be correct? No, not really, no. OK. The mounted one, I saw that in an antique and collectible shop in Cockermouth. Yeah. And it caught my eye. And then the second one, we've always had that in the family house. And I wondered if the two might be connected or not. They've both got a lustrous surface, slightly iridescent. So the first thing I notice when I look at this vase is that it's moulded. Um, and it's moulded with, I'm not sure, are they, they peacock feathers or whether it's emulating the trunk of a tree. Either way, the inspiration is nature. And nature was fundamentally important to a lot of Art Nouveau design in 1900. And both these vases date from much the same sort of period. I need to look under the base. Is there anything there? No, it's got a ground pond tool. That's a good sign. We'll have a look at the other one. Uh, the other one, it's all really about this very gentle dimple form and also that very dense iridescence, the natural light bouncing off it. One of the very first pieces I ever bought was that particular vase. Really? A long time ago. Yeah. And let's have a look underneath the base of this one. And again, you've got that nice ground pontal. These are, um, they're cousins. They're very Austro-German. They've been made at the same place. Uh, and that place is Klostermuller, and the factory is Lurtz. So the very fact that they're not marked mm. indicates that they were probably made for the home market. So invariably, they would mark them, and they would mark them with Lurtz, and usually with Austria underneath. Which do you think is the most valuable? I think the mounted one. I just think it's more interesting. Do you? Especially with the mount. If I saw that um, retailing, I'd expect it to be in around about £450 bracket. If I saw this one retailing, I'd expect it to be in the £550 really? bracket. Because iridescence, mm. the strength of iridescence, is what a lot of Lurtz collectors are looking for. Yeah. But now you've got to put me out of my misery. How much did you pay for that? I paid 300 for that. All right, I think you did OK. Oh, good. I still like the one I bought better than the one that's been in the family, just because I, I really like the shape. I'm certainly going to keep my eye open for other bits of glassware from, as from today, yeah. 
What made you bring two old cows along to Antiques Roadshow today? Because I absolutely adore cows. I've adored cows since I was a child, mm -hmm. and these two mean a huge amount to me. And have you known them since you were a child? Yes. As a little girl, I used to sit on a cow while it was being milked in a cowgirl outfit. <laughs> so I started off loving cows when I was very, very young. So it's a long-time thing. Yes, and I've also had four Highland cattle in my life as well. You and cows have quite a history. And I can be an old cow too. <laughs> <laughs> I shall return to common porcelain in that case. Um, these are, I think you know they're Dutch. Yeah. Are from one of the best Dutch Delft factories. The Greek A factory it was one of the top factories. It was where William and Mary went to buy stuff when they were furnishing Hampton Court. So a noble lineage. And we know within three years when they were made, because the mark on the bottom is the mark of the owner of the factory from 1765 to 1768, mm. Jacobus Halder. So they are a pair of old cows. Yeah, they are. Um, <laughs> and they are really lovely. What I think is so nice is that because of their age, if these were later, there would be slip casts, so that would be liquid clay poured into the mould. But actually, these have been press moulded. So when you look, you can see all the fingerprints of somebody who's actually pressed the mould in. Oh, right. And of course, when you look inside the head, they would have to have started with the horns. Yeah. We hear you, yes. <laughs> They'd have to start with the horns, press into the horns and the ears, and then kind of work their way back from the head. So there's a lot of skill gone into it. So that'd be one person that would do that. Yes, yeah. exactly. So, you quite like them. I love them. I, well, I take it back, you love them. <laughs> These cows went to market, you'd mm. have to get 3,000 of your good English pounds out. Right. Mm. That's not too bad. Not too bad for a pair of old cows. No. Despite <laughs> the broken horn. Yeah, I know, it's rather sad. The cow with the crumpled horn. Yeah, that's what one of my Highland cattle were. Oh. I had one with a crumpled horn, so well, there, there you go. Are. So they found the perfect yeah. home. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> and the boat approves as well. <laughs> A Lakeland beauty, what perfect setting to find a painting of this beautiful rustic girl seated before a lake. Where did it come from? Well, I bought it off the internet. I was brought up in the Lake District and as soon as I saw her, it reminded me of the story of the Maid of Buttermere, the famous daughter of the landlord of the Fish Inn at Buttermere. Well, the Maid of Buttermere dates to the 1800s, around 1802, and that is a story that became very popular. What more do you know about her story? Well, there were a lot of writers in the Lake District, obviously around this time, and they must have uh, been drinking there, and they saw this young woman and uh, thought she was wonderful mm. and started to write about her. Yes. So quite a few other men made their way to the pub. Eventually, a gentleman came by, well, I call him a gentleman, he turned out not to be really, um, saying he was an MP and that his name was Colonel Hope, mm. and he uh, duped her into marriage. The actual Colonel Hope read it in a London paper mm. and said, hang on a minute, this mm. isn't me, I haven't married this young woman. So he was outed yes. and uh, in the end actually he was executed for pretending to be an MP yes. and she was left destitute. Well, it could be that the inspiration for this painting was the story of the Maid of Buttermere, but what I would say is that the painting is typical of the mid-Victorian taste for the rural idylls, the sentimental paintings of rustic scenes. And I would say that this painting definitely dates to this later period, so I think it's lovely to associate a story with it, but I think it's very difficult to say that this is the Maid of Buttermere. Yes. The initials in the bottom right-hand corner appear to be TJ, but they don't associate with an artist that I can think of. Mm. And I feel that although it's very accomplished in certain respects and lovely detail of the straw bonnet and the colours in the mountains, but the details are not as fine and as tight as some of the better known artists of that okay. time. But it is absolutely charming. And the setting, obviously, to see it here against this backdrop of, of Windermere, it couldn't look more magical. Well, certainly in the sunlight, that I'm seeing much more of the picture than I've ever noticed before. And so what did you pay for the painting? 300 pounds. Yes. Well, I would say that you did very well. At auction today, if you had it sort of nicely presented in a frame, I think you would find that it could easily reach in the region of about four to 600 pounds. Right. OK, yes. thank you very much indeed. It's been it's really interesting. It's something I've been wanting to know about ever since I bought it. Thank you. 
The Lake District has long been famed for its natural beauty. But from time to time, the serenity of these waters has been disturbed by some incredible men in their floating machines. Just listen to that. The sound of speed on Windermere. This is a carefully restored 1930s motorboat from the museum's collection. Flat out, it can do 35 miles per hour. When it comes to fast boats, these waters have a rich history. Down the years, several new world water speed records have been set in the Lake District. But two of those record holders lost their lives in the attempt. The most famous was, of course, Donald Campbell. On January the 4th, 1967, he set out to break his own record on Coniston Water. He was traveling at 300 miles per hour in a boat powered by the engine from a jet fighter when he lost control and was tragically killed. That was a few miles away at Coniston Water, but for most of the 20th century, the place to come for speed was Windermere. Campbell wasn't the first to attempt record-breaking speeds across these still waters. He had an equally illustrious predecessor in the 1920s. Henry Seagrave was a World War I fighter pilot who was famous for his exploits behind the wheel of a car. I met up with Dr. Tom Young, curator at the Windermere Jetty Boat Museum, to find out more. Tell me about Henry Seagrave. So he broke three world speed records on land and was the first man to travel over 200 miles per hour in a car. And then he came to Windermere and set about breaking the water speed record. And it all went horribly wrong. Yeah, it was June the 13th, 1930. And he actually joked to his crewmate, Michael Wilcox, about whether it was auspicious or not to try and break the record on Friday the 13th. So he completed two runs and averaged just under 99 miles per hour, 98.76 miles per hour, which had broken the previous records um, just a year before. But he wasn't satisfied, and he decided to turn the boat around and attempt another run. And it was on that run that the boat started to swerve and then flipped unexpectedly and catapulted him and his two crewmates out of the boat. Halliwell was killed immediately, and Seagrave's unconscious but alive body was dragged from the lake, taken to hospital, and he recovered consciousness just long enough to ask about the fate of his lads, and was told he'd broken the record and then passed away shortly after. Oh. And he was clearly a hell of a guy. Absolutely. In his own lifetime, he became a modern celebrity and a, a national hero. Seagrave's accomplishment is celebrated by our host today. The museum's collection charts the technological breakthroughs that enabled this most dangerous of sports. But perhaps their most poignant exhibit is the humblest. It's Seagrave's wicker seat salvaged from the boat in which he died. What a delightful silver tea service. It's oriental, obviously, in design. Yeah. Can you tell me a bit about what you know about it? I don't know a great deal about it. It belonged to my grandfather, and he, as far as we know, got it at the end of the Great War. He was an army medic out in India. And I think it was when he was out there that he came upon it. Whether he went to Japan or somewhere like that, I don't know. It's not actually Japanese, it's Chinese. Oh, right. Yeah. Yes. And it dates from about 1880, 1890. Um, you've got this teapot with the side handle, which I think is particularly attractive, isn't it? Yes, it's very odd, but uh, it, it works. If, if you try and pour some out, it actually works. So you've got the teapot, the two-handled sugar basin, and the little milk or cream jug. Yeah all done in hammered silver. Now, the interesting feature, from my point of view, are the characters on the front. Yes. Yeah. Now, roughly translated, the top one means trust or faith, and the bottom one actually means agate, as in the stone agate, oh, really? hard stone. And when you combine these two Chinese characters and say them out loud, together they sound like a British surname which is Thomas. Really? Goodness. It's the family name, and my grandfather was Thomas, so... Well, you see, that would lead me to believe that that has been specially commissioned, obviously, for him, 
So it's not something he's picked up on the shelf of a Chinese silver shop. He's gone to a Chinese silversmith really? to have that commissioned. Or someone that he knows, perhaps a company he was working with or friends, have clubbed together mm. to make it for him. Goodness gracious. Chinese silver is, is much sought after. It's a very unusually small size. It's quite delicate. I, I rather like it myself. I think it's very, very attractive. If that were to come on the open market, you're comfortably going to get a thousand to fifteen hundred pounds for it. That's tremendous. Hmm. That's really interesting. Thank you very much. It's more no, than I expected. Yeah, no, it's a joy to see it. And if I were taking it home, I'd be getting my polish out. I can tell you. <laughs> I will do the same thing. <laughs> In this wonderful Lakeland setting with a wonderful wooded background, I'm looking at an army badge which actually takes us thousands of miles away deep into the Burmese jungle. The badge belonged to my late dad, John yes. Stanley Storer. Died in 2010 at the age of 91. Gosh. I knew he'd fought in the army in the Second World War, but he was one of these people who just sort of internalised it, never spoke about it. He couldn't. He, it was too emotional for him. He joined the Territorial Army in Grimsby in 1939, so he would have been 20. You have very kindly given me a crib sheet, which he wrote. Yes. I mean, this is probably the only thing he ever wrote, wrote down, isn't it? It is. I only found that a few weeks ago. The Second World War starts, and the regiment is sent with many others to fight in France. And we all know how that ended in Dunkirk. Yes. And I, what he's put here is very simple. Taken off there, Dunkirk, by the paddle boat Royal Daffodil, June the 3rd, 1940. Very dismissive, as though he's gone on a, 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 <laughs> a, sea a day trip, trip or something, day trip. yes. Then from there, he and his regiment, they go off to North Africa, where he becomes a desert rat, 8th Army. And again, there's a wonderful comment there. Crossed the Sinai Desert three times, lousy. Yes. <laughs> it's it's what he's anymore. not saying, isn't it? And if that isn't enough, he then ends up as a chindit fighting in Burma. The chindits, these large military groups, dropped behind the lines to disrupt the enemy, mm. were a new idea in the Second World War. You drop 20,000 people in who become established as a base supplied by air behind the lines, causing major disruption. And I find it extraordinary. Burma, for three and a half months, some of us came out. Mm. Now, there it tells you the story, doesn't yes. it? What we've got here are some, to me, remarkable things, which are photographs taken in the jungle. Now, these are very, very rare things. Here we've got a parachute falling in a jungle, dropping not a person, but a canister. Mm. That is supplies. So you've got to clear the jungle and build airstrips so the supplies could come in. And they involve a very famous local Burmese tribe called the Nagas, who were very pro-allies for support. It's a sort of guerrilla combat yes. on a huge scale. A very rare photograph, this is a group of Nagas, yeah. these local guerrillas who, who fought with the British. And finally, the one that is very moving, temporary graves. Yeah. Some of us came out. Well, some and quite a lot didn't. Many were left And they behind. were buried yes. in the jungle. And he never told you any of that? No. No, he did. I've learnt more just talking to you. He writes on a lot of the things he's written, he always writes, keep smiling, and that's something he carried through all his life. I've got loads of things. Keep smiling, yeah. you know, on the back of photographs, on letters, on cards. It makes me look at him in a different light because I only ever knew him as dad, as, yeah. as did my brother. But to hear of all those things that he went through, you, you can't live through something like that and not come out unscathed or with scars. I mean, I think he's a, a remarkable man. Values, well... The Chindit badge, in collector terms, is a very desirable thing. You know, there weren't that many. It's probably 150, couple of hundred pounds. The rarest thing are these photographs. Yes, I thought so. I've never seen anything like that. Photographs taken, in effect, on the front line. There, yes. We're looking, again, at probably a, a few hundred pounds here. But, you know, I'm almost embarrassed talking about money. Yes, yeah. Here is a, a really extraordinary man who had a... I mean, for God's sake, to go from Dunkirk to Burma via Tobruk is a pretty extraordinary adventure. Quite a journey. And at the end of it, he was still smiling. Yes, he was. And, and to us, it's the connection to him that these things give us. Clearly, they'll be kept in the family.
I actually thought I would be very upset talking to Paul, but I've managed, because it's so interesting and because it's, it's sort of in honour of Dad, if you like, um, we need to tell his story, we need to remember his story and the story of all the others. To Leslie, thanks a million for everything you have done to make my trip a happy one. Gene Autry, of course, he is the singing yeah. cowboy. He's great. <laughs> Who's Leslie? Leslie was my late husband's grandfather, and he was the manager and director of all the Odeon cinemas in 1939. And Gene Autry came over to premiere one of his films and stayed with grandfather, and grandfather had to look after him. He was a megastar, wasn't he? Huge. I mean, we, you think John Wayne was, yeah. was a megastar, but I think he was bigger than him. Gene Autry's hat. <laughs> It looks good. <laughs> the Singing Cowboys hat and picture, maybe five, six hundred pounds mm. on a good day. It was a 40th birthday present for my entire family. Oh, I know. Oh, that's <laughs> lovely. I dated around 1880, and it would have been one of a pair of earrings. Just really? the way that it's designed, and also the little fitting on the back is very typical of earring fittings. The rubies, of course, are a lovely pinky red yeah. colour. Not too dark, not too light. I just love it. <laughs> so an auction estimate in today's market, around about 1,500 to 2,000. Wow. If it had been a pair of earrings. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> At the water's edge of the beautiful Lake Windermere, so it seems really appropriate that we've got a sailing interest collection here and this wonderful photograph of this lady called Mrs Afra Cross. Can you tell me who she is? Afra was my grandmother and uh, yes, she was quite a sailor. She decided to join the man's world and uh, start racing, which I think was very unusual. Definitely. And what period are we talking about? She bought her boat in 1935 and raced really until the war. And she was extremely successful at what she did. It looks like she is because I looked at the inscriptions on both of these trophies hmm. and these aren't small events. You've got the Royal Yacht Squadron Cup over here, probably the most prestigious yachting club in, in Britain. Hmm. And this tray here is the Royal Southern Yacht Club. Indeed. And the centenary yes. race. She was a very determined lady. And uh, in 1935, in fact, she won 16 of the 17 flags in her class. This tray was an interesting story to that one because she was in the garden celebrating after her victory. And they didn't have um, a prize or a trophy for her for that class. And they said, Afra, what are we going to do? We're very apologetic, a bit embarrassed. She <laughs> said, they said, is there anything you want? And she said, well, actually, I rather fancy that silver tray is the way to walk by. And that's how she... And she grabbed... Well, she had a really good eye because it's actually a Garrard silver tray and it dates London 1849. Oh, so it's right. quite an <laughs> old tray and it's a beautiful size and a lovely, lovely weight. And what about the brooch here? Well, the brooch she had made, that is her sailing burgee. So those were her colours that she sailed with. Her name was Cross, so it's uh, blue sapphires with a, with a white cross. It's set in platinum, really good quality. It would have been made by one of the really good British jewellers. It could also be by Garrard. Who knows? Yes. It's not marked, but it's certainly a beautiful piece. And she wore it all the time. Wonderful. And, and the trophy? Well, this is a, a trophy she won in 1937. This was presented at the Royal Yacht Squadron. But of course, in those days, ladies weren't allowed in the squadron. And so it was presented to her, uh, I gather from the balcony, into the garden. Well, she was in quite good company because I believe that the Queen was disallowed from entering the, the, the club and she was a patron. We're looking at a, a period in, of the 19th through to the 20th century where it was, as I said, very male-dominated. Yeah. I can't think of any other female professional sailors mm. that were winning events like this really until people like Tracy Edwards and Ellen MacArthur. Yes, some you know, years later. 50 or 60 years later. Yes, yes. So she was so ahead of her time. 
I would really value it as a whole collection rather mm -hmm. than separate items yes. because it all relates to her. Women's sporting history is, is so prevalent at the moment mm. and the fact that she was such a forerunner at this time, mm. I would have absolutely no hesitation in valuing the collection at 10 to 15,000 pounds. Of course she'd be delighted, she would be delighted. very modest little pot. Very grey, slightly dirty, slightly wonky, decoration reserved only onto one side. Where did you get it? We got it in a town in the south of Japan a couple of years ago, in a junk shop. Right, OK. And why did you buy it? We loved all those things that you just described <laughs> about it. All the imperfections. It was buried amongst a lot of tat. Yes. But it, it stuck out. It was just a bit more delicate and a little bit more, yeah, wonky, actually, yeah, wonky. Yeah. Do you use it for anything? We just have it amongst a sort of bigger pottery collection on a shelf. We admire it for its contrast with more modern sort of okay. pieces. Uh, you know what the original purpose was? I don't know. Drink. Sake, possibly. Um, you bought it in Japan. <laughs> it could be Japanese. It could be Korean. There is a link between the two. Do you know what it is? Well, I know that in the south of Japan there was, or perhaps even still is, a Korean contingent of potters working there. Yeah. And there has been for a couple of hundred years, as I yeah. understand it. And it's very grey. Japanese porcelain, believe it or not, this is porcelain, uh, is very grey. It's very different to Chinese porcelain, but so is Korean porcelain. It's also very, very grey. The decoration's done very, very rapidly. You've got this lovely stem of, I think it has to be a very stylized bamboo, and then these little florets around the shoulder. How old do you think it is? Uh, I thought it was maybe about 150 years old. So that would take us into the middle of the 19th century. Yeah. I think we've got to go back a bit further. This particular shape, to me, suggests a European glass bottle shape of the 1600s. And I would say it's probably dating to around 1650, maybe up to 1700. Wow. So it's a little bit older than your 150 years. <laughs> How much do you pay for it? We paid about five pounds for it. <sighs> Ooh, five pounds for a 17th century wine <laughs> bottle. These particularly Japanese and Korean pieces have gone like that on the scale over the last few years. But I think a Japanese porcelain collector probably would be prepared to pay up to about 500 pounds. Wow. So we can put two noughts on your purchase price and perhaps you should try it out to see if it works. Yes, yeah, get some sake into it and have it with the next Japanese dinner we cook. <laughs> well, that's a mystery solved. There's not much that can catch out our experts, and they like nothing more than setting us and mere mortals a challenge. This week we are playing Guess, not the mystery object, three mystery objects with Adam, Adam Schoon. We've been here before with this kind of thing, and I've not done well. So you've brought along three items of treen, as it's known. I cannot imagine what these are for, so it's going to be a tricky one. Treen, small items of wood. Without any further ado, item one, a rosewood carrot. Is it 19th century and for powdering bees by a gentleman beekeeper to keep down the mites, this being the mouthpiece, this being where the powder would issue forth, or is it a late 17th century wig powderer? <laughs> this big chunk of wood is made of lignum vitae, a very, very heavy wood. Is this for knocking the dents out of beer mugs in the 18th century? Or is its origin in the 19th century as a pork pie mould? And then what about this thing, which is beautifully carved? Mm. You are welcome to use me but pray don't abuse me. And this is beautiful, but the back is really something. So it says here, William Shaw, 1744. And then look at this. Absolutely beautiful. This is certainly my favorite out of all of them. So it's made of sycamore. Is it 18th century as a bottle stand? And the little indent at the top is for putting the cork in, or is it just simply a dinner plate? Right. Well, this one I've got a theory about, but the other two I haven't got a clue. So this is where you come in, folks. Do you want to hazard a guess at any of these? The middle item, I don't think it's a pork pie mould because 
you have the resin in the wood and it's not a very good idea. I think it's more for the pots. Bashing out the yeah. pot. And what, what kind of, what, pewter pots? Yes. Mm. Definitely a pork pie mould. All right. <laughs> <laughs> what about the, the sort of carrot? I think that's for powdering wigs. Because from here, it looks as though it's been very well looked after. And I don't think a beekeeper would look after it to that extent. I like your thinking there. Any idea, any of them? Well, I think the square thing is a plate, a dinner plate, because you talk about a square meal, and they used to be on uh, square platters. So that's my reason for that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> OK. Well, I assumed straight away this was alcohol-related because of don't abuse me. So I'm assuming this is for a wine bottle. I've no idea about this one. But the consensus seems to be pork pie. Not everybody, but pork pie, so I'll go with that. And then at the end, I agree that it's too fine for a beehive, I would have thought. So I'm going to say, with the help of my friends here, that was for powdering a wig, this was for moulding a pork pie, and this was to stand your wine bottle. OK, conclusive? Any last changes of mind? No. In that case, I will reveal all. You got one of the three right. Oh, only one? Yes. Oh, guys! <laughs> oh, no! This is indeed for powdering wigs, and they are incredibly rare. And you literally would fill it with powder, somebody would blow, and it allowed you the flexibility to... It's because it wiggles around, doesn't it? Does. It does. Yeah, so you could get the powder spread around these huge wigs that both ladies and gentlemen wore. OK, so this is what we got wrong. Yeah, this is known as a tankard jack. And because of the softness of beer jugs back in the 17th and 18th century, at the end of the night, beer mugs had dents, which means if you didn't knock the dents out, somebody would get a short measure the next day. And hence, lignum vitae. Very hard. Rock hard. It is actually, from there, a pint of wood, but you put it in and then you rocked it and rolled it. Lynn, madam, this is you, the square meal. I know, my heart dropped. Oh, I know, especially yeah, because I thought, oh, she's got I a know. point there. In fact, you stole one of my lines about the square <laughs> meal. But anyway, it's known as a trencher, and the shape goes back hundreds of years, if not a 1,000 years, when you had a square piece of bread on a square piece of wood and, you know, the gravy would dribble off, so they put a hollow circular groove to catch all the dribbles. What a top idea. I know. And the little indent, Fiona, is actually for salt. Now, look, I'm going to offer you the chance of a bonus point. <laughs> one of them's worth £5,000. The first one. One of them is worth £1,000, and one is worth 500 If you can name the most valuable, <laughs> you're almost squared up with me. <laughs> The workmanship on this is so extraordinary and beautiful. I mean, every time I get this wrong, the specialist always says to me, look, you should have just go, gone with your favourite. OK, so the, is the majority of you with that? Yes. Yes. All right, well, look, I, I, I defer. <laughs> I defer. <laughs> that okay. is the most valuable. So you're going with the crowd, not your gut feeling. Mm. You should have gone with your gut feeling. <laughs> <It's> that one. <laughs> Always go with your gut. Oh, feeling. that's what everyone says every time when I get it wrong. So, Sorry. so this is worth five thousand. This is worth about one thousand pounds, and the old tanker jack about five hundred pounds. Well, it was good fun though. It was, and thank you, everyone. <laughs> but nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Here we have an original quad poster, Dr. No, the first James Bond film starring Sean Connery. And we can see here, hiding in the shadows, is Dr. No, written by Ian Fleming. Where did you get this poster from? My wife and I scraped it from the cellar wall of my grandmother's house. Up you in scraped it? Scraped it, yeah, with uh, wallpaper oh. knives. This was one of... 30 or 40 movie posters. So you scraped it off with a scraper. You can see a few mm. marks where you've done that. A large amount of marks. Yeah. But the film itself, the first ever James Bond film, has gone down in history now. I think Sean Connery was the best Bond. Is he your favourite? Yeah, he's yeah, my favourite yeah, Bond, yeah. yeah. The Vatican 
issued a special communique saying that this was bringing the moral sentiment of the nation down. And in Ireland, the posters that they displayed, they had to put clothes on the models. It was too risque for the time being Catholic countries. Only last year, a Doctor No, the first James Bond film poster, in fantastic condition, in an international auction house, made £87,000. Really? Crikey. Now, I think that was a slightly one-off because someone just wanted it. Yeah. But they often sell for £30,000. Really? And I think even in this rather worn condition, being scraped off the wall, it would have an auction guy price of five to six thousand pounds. That's not bad, is it? Really? Wow. So not bad for half a day's work scraping off the wall. I'm really glad because it needs to be saved as well. Yeah. It's iconic now. Yeah. I think given another ten years, it might maybe increase a bit more. So be worth keeping, I think. For yeah. I'm glad investment. you've decided what we're doing. That's, that's great. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what I think. To see your face once more A quick sight as it passes by From the heart to the eyes See every day's too long For what you got going on So Brilliant chaps, well done. Thank you very you, much. You obviously play together as a band, don't you? Oh, yes, um, we do, we do. But what fascinates me is actually the guitar that you're playing it on. Where did you get it? Uh, well, I used to do a lot of brass banding as a kid. Um, a tuba was my first instrument. And I was in the uh, practice rooms one day, and one of the grandparents of the members came in with these two guitars. And this one, this one was in a case, and the other one looked absolutely battered. And I went up to him and asked, oh, what are, you, what are you doing with those guitars? And he said, I'm just going to throw them in the skip. And I was like, what? You know, you can't, can't do that. I'll, I'll take them off your hands. Like, so he was like, yeah, that's fine. The other guitar is now, I think we smashed it up for a music video or something. But Because uh, <laughs> it was really, it was terribly unplayable. Like, it was all warped and all. But this, that one you saved. Oh, yeah, we saved this one. Because uh, I thought, like, wow, this looks a bit... Uh, it looks a bit more interesting. Yeah, just a, just a wee bit. It's quite an unusual guitar. It's quite small, isn't it? Mm. And the label in there has a name which is Louis Panormo. That's right. Um, now, Louis Panormo was a London guitar maker, mm. making really good quality instruments, and he was well, well renowned at the time, the period which we tend to call the Romantic era, basically. Now, that's generally assumed to be a period between about 1790 and 1830. But there's also a handwritten date on the label, 1845. That's right, that's the one later on in his production. Uh, okay. What you're doing is playing it in a very modern way, of course. Oh, yeah. But when that guitar was made, it was made to play classical music, mm. so to speak, in this period. It was very popular. So you get people like Schubert writing for guitar. I mean, I'm not... I'm no classical guitarist, but, you know, I'll do just do a wee bit of, like... With... Isn't the tone really, really lovely? Oh, no, it's fantastic, especially in the lower register. You get, like, I mean, like... You know, it's, very... it's got a real resonance. Yeah, it does. It's a very, very fascinating instrument. Let's talk about value. It's a difficult one because a Panormo guitar of that period in really, really good condition is probably going to be worth around about £2,000. This one is a little bit worse for wear. Yeah. And I think in this condition, it's probably worth about seven to £900. Still, that's, that's, that's still pretty good. Like... Yeah, <laughs> but... There is room to restore it. Yeah. But if you enjoy it, play it. Mm. It's been a pleasure. What's the name of the band, by the way? The Left Backs. The Left Backs. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Left Backs. Play us out. And I don't know what is real. And I don't know what is fake. Well, I don't know what I don't know. And I can't know. Now, this is a painting by Anwar Shamsa, who, in the 50s, he was one of the movers and shakers in Pakistan, which is a long way from Windermere. So I'm wondering how 
this painting of his of city walls came to be yours? Well, Anwar Shemza was my teacher in the 60s at my senior school and I admired him very much as a teacher. He took me to London with the art group and introduced me to the National Gallery and then took the group to an exhibition of his own at the Commonwealth Buildings in London. What um, was the school called where he taught you? It was Ounsdale Comprehensive School in Wombourne, which is near Wolverhampton. And what was he like as a teacher? Very influential. He introduced me to the Impressionists, Cezanne, Paul Clay. Well, I'm interested you mention Paul Clay because Clay was one of Shemza's favourite artists, a real inspiration to Shemza. And I think you can see that in this picture, both in the colour and also in the stylized way in which he's created these walls. Now, he, he did study in Lahore, and we don't know where these walls are, but they could be walls back in Lahore. So did you get these straight from him? No. Um, sadly, he died in the 80s, and his wife was selling some of his works. And then what is it that you particularly like about this one? The colour and the atmosphere of it. I gifted it to my daughter when she left home because it was on her bedroom wall. Oh, Margaret. lucky you. <laughs> yes. This is a really interesting one to consider because he was, as I say, in the 50s, one of the leading lights of the contemporary art scene in Pakistan. He was known as a poet. He wrote several books in Urdu. He was a really great cultural presence at the time. And then, of course, he came to Britain, he started at the Slade, and he came to teach you. And I think yeah. this picture really encapsulates all of that, and yes. it gives us an insight into the Commonwealth movement of people as well. So I think in terms of value, if this was to come onto the auction market today, we would probably put an estimate in the region of 1,000 to 1,500 pounds. Yes. Well, it's considerably more than what you paid for it. Isn't <laughs> yes. it? Do you remember what you paid? Uh, I paid £65 oh, for it. Oh, great, you should have bought more. <laughs> I did. I went along with the intention of just buying one, but I came away with three. <laughs> These are two of the most wonderful Royal Naval Officer swords that we've ever had on the roadshow. How did you get hold of them? Well, I inherited them from my parents. They were helping a local farmer clear out his barn. And the farmer basically said, take what you want, so they asked him whether they could have the swords and he said, yes, take them. Um, you've done a little bit of research on where you think they came from. Yeah. What, what's come out of that then? Basically, the, the swords were presented to Captain Laws. He was in the East Indies when the Rear Admiral was appointed as the Commander-in-Chief of the East Indies Station. And about a year after, he went back to the UK with Captain Laws commanding the vessel. And I presume the swords were given to him because he took the Admiral and his wife back to the UK. There's a record of it yeah. on this bit that's come off the scabbard. A mark of regard from Rear Admiral Edward Owen to Captain Laws of HMS Southampton. And the most wonderful bit is the date, 1833. It really confirms that this is one of the earliest specimens of this particular naval officer sword that I've ever seen. When the Royal Navy adopted a new sword in 1827, it filled in all the holes of the hill, so you get this solid basket, and that's really quite tough. Yeah. And they also put on it a really very, very good fighting blade that's um, known as either a pipe bag or a quill bag because of the, the round part. And then it goes into this great big spear point. Mm. And you, look, you just look at the size and the proportion of that, and that was obviously bought as a fighting sword. Yeah. This is the sort of thing that Nelson would have recognised. You know. okay. <laughs> Nelson once said that no captain will ever do much wrong if he lays his ship alongside that of the enemies and tries to board, and that's what you would be boarding with. It's just a very, very high-quality sword. And bearing in mind how old it is, it is in exceptionally good condition. I'm presuming they're a pair. No, I don't think they were made as a pair. No? Okay. I think Captain Laws, when he went into the Royal Navy, probably bought himself a sword, and then he was given this really nice one. Mm. OK. Yeah. And they're both of them within the first decade of the sword being changed, and you just don't see those. That's, that's why I'm so excited about it. Right. <laughs> We're very excited yeah, as well now. <laughs> the lesser of the two would probably be worth 1,000 to £1,200. Pounds. 
Okay. <laughs> the, present, <laughs> the presentation Asian. one. Yeah. And here's where you have got the human story, the provenance. Mm. That would probably be worth 2,500 to 3,000 pounds. I think it's an absolutely mm. wonderful sword. Yes. <laughs> I suddenly like them more. <laughs> The Lake District is the setting for the classic children's adventure tale Swallows and Amazons, written by Arthur Ransom, who lived nearby. Our paintings expert Rupert Moss is a keen sailor and he was thrilled to climb aboard a famous little boat. So normally on Reggie, I'm doing pictures and today, joy of joys, I'm sitting on a boat, and not just any boat, but the boat from Swallows and Amazons, the movie, 1974, which I saw, age 14. And it, I, it's fair to say it got me into sailing, just watching yeah. the romantic lives of these children this wonderful summer. It never seemed to rain, the sun was always out. It was filmed and shot here. Uh, one of these islands could even have been the one they spent the night on. How did you get her? Well, after the film, it was stored in a boatyard on the Thames, and 35 years later, they decided to downsize and move. So all the boats they're storing came up for auction. And the Arthur Ransom world got to hear of this. And uh, a few of us decided we had to try and buy Swallow. So uh, my colleague Magnus started crowdfunding, and basically, and there's about 85 of us chipped in to buy her. And how much did you end up paying for it? Well, the group of us paid five and a half thousand just under and our objective is to keep her in the public domain taking people out sailing what date is she about 1920 something something like that i like to think it's uh, about 1930 when the book was published so that'd be a nice coincidence. And she's not overly restored or spruced up. She's in this lovely workaday condition, so you can just take her out anytime you want. That's right. And we take lots of people out. In the book, she was a rough and ready farmer's boat. So we don't want to over restore her. She's got these lovely mahogany clinker built planks here. Yeah. And I think they're elm, these ribs, which are bent, aren't they? they are. Around steam the shape bent. of the boat, steam bent, and then clenched with these copper rivets. Um, she's just gorgeous. I've got to value her. Surprisingly, there are quite a few boats of this kind of vintage yeah. still around, really. And uh, if one comes up, you'd think it might be worth two, three thousand pounds or something like that. The association of that iconic film, it, it's just so powerful, or it is to me, and I think to a generation of sailors. And so, I, I, without hesitation, I'm going to put 20 to 30 thousand pounds on her. <laughs> well, I'm glad we crowdfunded and bought her because. Uh... That's incredible. I hope that value won't stop me using her to sail with it. No, not at all. No, that's what she's for. That's what boats are for, as you know. Well, cast off then. Cast off. This is absolutely brilliant. That's it, lovely. It's been in the family for 50 years and it was given to my father-in-law, who was a pilot with BOAC. He was flying out of Mexico City and they had an engine failure on takeoff. After that, a gentleman came to the cockpit and said, thank you for saving my life, I thought I was going to die. Here, have this little pot. It's actually from Chipicuro, which is an ancient civilization near the Valley of Mexico. It's about 100 BC, so probably one of the oldest things we've had on the roadshow. In terms of valuation, it's not as much as it should be, between 100 and 150 pounds. But with such a marvellous story, it's priceless. Absolutely. It's a charity collecting box going back to the end of the First World War. And it is sat on the bar at the Grey Bull Inn in Penrith, where my great-great aunt was the licensee. You would expect one of these to make about 500 pounds. Really? And so they should, they're a nice thing. I thought it would be very appropriate to have a First World War penny in it. This is a 1915 penny, so here we go. Pop it on the uh, tray, pull it back to full charge and fire! There we go. My aim was always as good as I thought it was. <laughs> this is a great looking thing. I mean, it's real sculpture, very decorative. Yeah. To some people, it would be spooky. I mean, mm. do you know where it's from? Yeah, I think it's Nigerian. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's from the Igbo or Igbo yeah. in southeastern Nigeria. How does it come to be with you? 
I grew up in Kenya, um, so we always had oh, African right. things around um, the house. This is from the other side of the continent. It is, yeah. Basically, I was in my 20s, I walked past a junk shop in Swansea, and I saw it in the front, and it was apparently a house clearance from somebody who'd lived in Africa. And I went in, and it was quite a lot of money for me. Right. Paid 100 pounds. How long ago? How many that years ago? That was 1996. Yeah, that was a fair amount. That yeah. was most of my beer money for that month. Commitment to your art. <laughs> I've never regretted paying yeah. it. Masks were part of ceremonial costume. This is a helmet mask. I can see from the colour inside and the patina and the wear on here yeah. that this has been worn and danced. Yeah. And then you would have had costume with probably grass, something that moved yeah. and they would use to represent spirits and ancestors. And the, the dancer would have really got into character and become the spirit or ancestor that yeah. he was representing. Mm. I've only ever put it on my head once and it yeah. felt wrong. <laughs> so, you didn't have the rest of the ceremonial the costume. The, no, exactly. No. It, it's 20th century. Yeah. And masks like this, especially with this power, mm. are, are quite popular yeah. for people that collect tribal art. And really, the place where this mask would sell best would be Paris, first of okay. all, and maybe New York. They have okay. sales, especially for this quality, this type of thing. Mm -hmm. A mask like this would have a pre-auction estimate, I think, of three to five thousand pounds. Wow. I, yeah, I didn't think it was anything like that. That's a lot of money. It's a great looking thing. Yeah. And I'd have this on my shelf any day of the week. Well, I'm taking it home with me, I'm afraid. Well now, something of a rather eclectic group of items. We've also got a piece of paper here, which it's got the name Paul Cooper. What's the significance of that? As my grandmother's writing, she wrote down the name of the person she believed to have designed the pendant, and the name below is her, the initials of her mother. Tell us a little bit about your great-grandmother, then. She and her husband, my great-grandfather, were very much involved in the arts and crafts movement. Yep. They designed their own arts and crafts house and, and had it built in Carlisle. I'm led to believe that the pendant was designed for her. She and her husband designed a lot of stuff themselves. She did amazing embroidery. There is a craftsman, a highly important jewellery craftsman, called John Paul Cooper. Okay. And this is the person who I think ah. we're talking about here. John Paul Cooper specialised in this kind of very, very small little bits of workmanship. Now, unfortunately, I've had a look at the piece and there's no signature, so we can't state for certain that it's definitely by John Paul Cooper. No. But I would like to think that the style of it is very much his own. And often you would have designs where you'd have leaves, as we've got here, and a signature motif that he often used was bunches of grapes. Ah. The pale blue stone in the centre is what we call a water sapphire. It probably right. came from Ceylon, and they deliberately chose them, the arts and crafts jewellers and craftsmen, because they were subtle. Suspended here, we have three natural pearls, deliberately chosen because they were misshapen, okay. because they had individuality and style. I now want to move on to this one. Mm -hmm. This is a simple necklace in gold, and in the lid it's got the name Murphy. What was your story about that one? I was given that when I turned 18 by my grandmother. It had been made for her when she turned 21. This is a really important piece of jewellery. Oh, OK. It belongs to my daughter now. <laughs> really? Yes, it does. OK. This one really gets me very excited. Okay. And the reason it does is the name Murphy. Henry George Murphy he was a craftsman. He was active in the 1920s. He had a shop in London's Marlebon called the Falcon Studio. Right. Now, this piece here, there, it has a little tiny plaque on the back, which is HGM mm -hmm. with the Falcon stamp. Ah. And that means it's a signed Murphy piece of jewellery. Wow. And that makes it incredibly important. Okay. Now, to give you an idea, Harry Murphy's jewellery was sold last year mm -hmm. in a sale room. And the biggest piece sold for £90,000. Oh. <coughs> yes, OK. I'm hoping mine are not that valuable. <laughs> well, let's give you an idea of what I think they're worth. 
The John Paul Cooper, we hope, piece is not signed. I think it is John Paul Cooper. We're looking at something like £8,000. Wow. Look, that's very interesting, because when I inherited it, I took it to a jeweller's in case it needed insurance, and they said, oh, no, it's not worth anything. Wrong. <laughs> the H.G. Murphy necklace, in its original box, ten pounds to £15,000. <gasps> OK. Yeah. <clears throat> I know this piece of jewellery. I've seen the drawings of this Have piece you? of jewellery. So, as a jewellery historian, when you see a piece of jewellery that all you've seen is diagrams of, you think, I wonder what happened to that. Yes. So I come all the way up to here to Windermere, and here it is in front of me. Yes. Wow. That's very nice to know. I'm absolutely thrilled. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All of us who do the road show have things we dream of seeing. It's a lost treasure, and it's here in Wendermere. What more could you ask? We so much enjoyed our day here at Lake Windermere. Think of all the places we've been to for the road show. I can't think of one more beautiful than this. From the Antiques Roadshow here on gorgeous, glorious Lake Windermere. Bye bye. Mm -hmm.